Jona Rubinstein. I am professor at the London School of Economics, and I am visiting the Institute for Business Innovation here at the wonderful UC Berkeley Haas. Talent management is important for firms that are innovating because human capital and talent is the key input in the process of innovation. It is even more important these days than ever before, at least uh, than ever before in modern times, given the excess demand for talent and the increasing talent premium measured in a variety of ways over the past 40 and perhaps 50 years. For these reasons, firms that are heavily involved in the process of innovation should be more careful than ever before in the management of talent. Specifically, they should develop and adjust their human resources strategies to deal with the global environment. They should do better in matching, in recruiting, in retaining, developing, and incentivizing the current workers. But they should do much better in bringing and attracting workers that are talent and have the ability to contribute to this process and are not involved these days. And here I would like to point to the role of women in the process of innovation. This century, the last century, and perhaps the last 50 years, uh, is the century of women. Women participate more than ever before in the labor market. They earn more. They are engaged in more demanding careers. They develop their skills. By the way, they are more educated than men these days. But nevertheless, they are less likely than men to be involved in the process of innovation, at least in the way that we can measure with observational data. Okay? We do find that women that possess the same cognitive and non-cognitive abilities as men are less likely to self-sort into jobs and occupations that are highly demanding uh, the ability to deal with non-routine cognitive and non-cognitive tasks. And therefore, while firms that are heavily involved in the process of innovation, while they should do better in incentivizing, recruiting, retaining, and development, the skills of their male workers, they should reconsider adjusting their human resources strategies to attract women to engage in this process. What should they do? In my view, their human resources strategies are well designed and are still designed to attract the current workers roughly speaking males. The hours worked, the compensation scheme, the structure of the pay incentives are excellent to fit the risk preferences and the hour preferences and the labor supply preferences of males. But these are not necessarily the best fit to attract equally able women. Given that women are at least 50% of the potential pool of able workers, perhaps the money and the future of innovation rest on the ability of the firms to attract this excellent talent labor to engage and develop in the process of innovation. Let me be more specific. Women have different tests than men with respect to risk. 
He firms offer wage contracts that incentivize workers by sharing the risk and profits, by paying per performance, which might be ideal for males. Okay? This might be not ideal for attracting women. Okay? In that case, these firms will be selecting workers. And actually, this is what I, they actually do. They select workers, not only on their ability to be productive in the process of innovation, but also on their taste for risk. Given the excess demand for talent, firms should not lose this type of workers. What does it practically mean? It means that they should be more flexible in the wage contracts that they offer. This flexibility should be also reflected in the hours worked. While the current uh, way work schedule practically is designed to fit well the labor supply preferences of males, with minor adjustment, it can be very attractive also for women. In that case, firms, industry, and the aggregate economy will benefit from a huge supply shift of able women into the process of innovation. And dynamic implications with respect to their own investment in their abilities and skills, namely in their productivity, uh, in the context of these particular jobs. So this is where actually firms, by equalizing the implicit opportunities to workers to work and contribute, can do well for themselves and well for the aggregate economy and for the society. And therefore, I think we should uh, encourage firms uh, to consider thinking in this direction. To summarize, the management of talent should adjust the human resources strategies to the global economy, the growing demand for talent, the excess demand for talent, and the increasing talent premium by attracting the missing supply of talent, the missing women. They should do that by uh, revising two key elements. The first one is the flexibility of working hours, and the second one is the risk sharing of profits. A unique aspect of the management of talent in innovation is the aggregation of knowledge and information among experts in teams. Knowledge and information is private. Different experts have different knowledge different experts have different information. So the micromanagement of talent management has to take that into account. Specifically, be aware that the process of aggregating information and knowledge in teams takes place in an environment in which the information is not perfectly shared, is asymmetric and imperfect. And therefore, they have to adjust the human resources strategies to be such that do not encourage herding phenomenon and yes-man behavior. The human resources strategies should address the key concern of moral hazard and adverse selection among experts that may lead to a herding behavior and a yes-man behavior, and therefore should redesign their human resources strategies in general and the incentive schemes in particular to avoid this type of behavior. Let me give you an example. 
if experts are being paid by whether or not the project ends being successful, rather than by sharing their private knowledge and their private information, they might end up following the crowd, ignore what they know, ignore their understanding, and actually recommend the project that seems to be the right project, rather than providing to the team, to the firm, and the organization, their private knowledge and information, the reason they were hired for. Let me give you another example. If experts okay, face a situation in which the group manager, the boss, the person that determines their eventually evaluation have strong priors about a particular project. They may actually tell him or her what they like to hear rather than what they should know. In situations like that, talent employees may actually deviate from the optimal behavior from the firm's perspective, but not from their perspective, when promotion and pay is based on how well the project ends up doing, rather than on me honestly sharing with you what I know. I may provide you what you want to hear, I may tell you what others are already saying. Okay. I may be right in projecting which project has to be pursued, but I will not fulfill the mission I was hired for. I will not provide you with the information and knowledge that I have and you don't have. Okay. What firms should do? They should redesign the pay contract and the promotions to be such that encourage people to share their knowledge and information and not discourage them doing that. They should pay people by them sharing their views even if these are not commonly accepted. And to say what they think even if they disagree with their bosses. The second element is actually some uh, perspective about who should be hired as the manager of the team. So far we were discussing uh, the employees' side. Okay. But actually the managers are important as well. And uh, uh, from uh, uh, my research with uh, uh, Ross Levine, okay, uh, uh, we learned that uh, uh, managers okay, are not the typical job. Okay. What we actually find using uh, data that follows these guys from early childhood till the days in which they perform as managers is that managers, as you might expect, are smarter than the typical job. They are not genius. Okay. They are type of jobs and occupations that on average attract even smarter people than managers. But they are smart. But they are especially high self-esteem and opinionated. So these are people that are not shy to express their views and to be clear about their priors. While this type of characteristics might be very effective in actually in the process of production in regular type of uh, jobs and products, this has non-trivial consequences in the process of innovation. When we actually like to encourage experts to share their information and knowledge, especially 
when it contradicts the priors of the owners and the bosses. Which tells me that firms should not only redesign the wage contracts and the way they evaluate and promote workers, but also reconsider who are the type of right managers for this type of jobs. Perhaps they should have more female managers than they have now. No, it is incorrect uh, to equate the characteristics of entrepreneurs and innovators for the simple reasons that they don't perform the same task in the economy. While there is some overlap between entrepreneurship and innovation, okay, entrepreneurship actually it's not innovation, and innovation can exist without entrepreneurship. Some of the new businesses also involve new products. Examples are known. But not everybody is Steve Jobs. Not all the entrepreneurs are Steve Jobs. And not all the innovators are working in just born films. Much of the innovation process happens in existing films. And much of the innovation process in new born films are not being done by the entrepreneurs. And therefore, it is not surprising to find that the self-sorting of individuals based on early determined cognitive and non-cognitive traits into this type of jobs and tasks is very different. From the joint work with Ross Levin, what we learn is that what makes a successful entrepreneur is the unique mixture of traits that on one hand, involves being smart, however not genius, possessing high level of self-esteem and high levels of locus of control, meaning that I take responsibility on things that happen to me. By the way, all these characteristics measured when these guys were teenagers, many years before actually they self-sought into this type of jobs and occupation. And on the other hand, uh, being to some extent illicit, which means these are guys that were more than any other else in the economy involved in behavioral problems while they were teenagers. So while successful entrepreneurs are those who possess this unique mixture of traits, because it's very rare to have smart guys who are illicit, and it's very rare to find among those who are heavily involved in behavioral problems while they were teenagers, to find among those smart guys, okay? So while this mixture of traits is very rare, and therefore successful entrepreneurship doesn't happen so often, the combination of traits that make people innovate is different. What we find when we look at that is that these guys are smarter than the typical entrepreneur. Okay? But on the other hand, they are super nerds as teenagers. And this is not surprising. Their comparative advantage is to specialize in the process of innovation, but not necessarily be to be the creators of a new business idea. And therefore, it will be a mistake from the firm's point of view, to equate the characteristics that are needed for innovation for the characteristics that are needed for entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs and innovators complement each other. They don't substitute each other. So these have implications for the process of innovation in the extensive and the intensive margin. While the process of innovation in the extensive margin, namely the creation and the innovation of new products via the creation of new businesses, will be involving entrepreneurship and innovation jointly, the process of innovation 
in the intensive margin, namely in existing films, do not necessarily involve the process of entrepreneurship. So what are the implications? The implications are that among the innovators, we may find that those who are, have a, perhaps a more a flexible attitude to risk are less likely to be risk aware, are more likely to deal well in uh, coping with unusual situations are good in working in a crazy work environment, are good in dealing with a crazy entrepreneur, will self-sort into startups. Okay? And they will have wage contracts that will be implicit partnership with the entrepreneur. On the other hand, those who are extremely clever and very able in the process of innovation, they are very good in dealing with non-routine, cognitive and non-cognitive demons, but they don't possess the non-cognitive skills that uh, are needed to cope with the uncertainty of a new business, with the risk involved in that, and so on. Perhaps these guys will find more attractive to participate in the process of innovation in existing fields in which the wage contracts can be less risky and the work hours less crazy. And this brings us back to uh, the missing a supply of talent, namely the missing able women in the process of innovation. In my view, they are mainly missing because the market for innovation does not offer the, the flexibility of wage and work hours that will fit their preferences with respect to their allocation of time and the risk and the share of risk. To summarize the practice of uh, modern management in the innovation uh, space, I would like to emphasize that it must take into account that the supply of talent is heterogeneous. It is not only supplied by white males, or supplied by minorities and women. The second thing that it must take into account is that the process of innovation involves sharing and aggregating knowledge and information among individual experts rather than the performance of routine tasks. This has key implications with respect to human resources strategies, specifically about the wage contracts and the flexibility of working hours, and has non-trivial implications about the ideal characteristics, cognitive and non-cognitive, of the modern managers. Mm -hmm.